Welcome to the latest event from the Long Distance Lowy Institute. I'm Ben Bland, the director of the Institute's Southeast Asia program, and I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respect to their elders past and present. I'm delighted today to be speaking to His Excellency Teodoro Loxin, who was appointed as Philippine Foreign Secretary in 2018 by President Rodrigo Duterte. Secretary Loxin has had a long, distinguished and varied career. He's a lawyer by profession and a journalist by trade. He's also served as a senior official and an elected legislator. He previously worked as legal counsel and speechwriter to President Corazon Aquino and speechwriter to Presidents Joseph Estrada and Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. Thank you, Secretary Loxin, for joining me today from Manila. Thank you so much for inviting me. First up, I want to ask you about your experience of diplomacy during the pandemic. I know that you've been able to travel a bit more this year to Indonesia, to China, to Washington, D.C. most recently. And of course, we have Zoom, uh, which we're using today. But how would you say that COVID-19 has impacted on your ability to do your job as, as foreign minister of the Philippines? Well, the first thing it did was it changed my job from being foreign minister to minister of repatriations and expatriations. When the, when the, the pandemic broke out, first thing that, um, that we, we attended to was that very many foreigners were stuck in the Philippines. And um, I have to give credit where it's due. And I asked the foreign governments um, to do, you know, to help us and all of that. And, and later on, I found out um, and you can correct this, that a foreign government, when its citizens are abroad, those citizens, and it's a very manly thing, uh, have to take care of themselves. But um, uh, the, the, the diplomatic corps here the, uh, uh, went out of their way. I, they didn't need to be told. In fact, they didn't care what the national governments wanted. They started rounding up all of their, uh, all of their tourists. The Germans were in the lead, the Belgians, uh, the Australians, the Canadians. And then they shared flights and they got them all out. Um, later on, they, they called up and, and thanked, their foreign ministers called up and thanked me. And I said, no, you also thank my, for, uh, my tour, uh, the tourism secretary, uh, Berna Puya. She virtually dismantled her, her whole department. You know, her department is to bring in tourists. She dismantled it. Let's get them out. And they did. And that really astonished everyone. And I was... So happy and so proud of the diplomatic corps. We got, then comes the second part, um, repatriating Filipinos. We have 10 million Filipinos abroad. Well, uh, effectively, I think we have about 4 million in, in the Middle East. And um, we got them home. I've gotten home, I think, half a million already. And uh, we were, uh, we could have done it faster, but our capacity to quarantine them when they come in was a bit limited. Um, although I must say, without not trying to raise our chair, we did a pretty good job. We got them. All, we got everyone who wanted to go home got home. As I said, I want them home if they want to go home. Uh, I want them home if they're dead. Doesn't matter to me. Just bring them all home. So that's it. That's what we are. We're now, of course, some of my uh, colleagues said, "Little boy, you brought them all home. Please don't lose their jobs abroad." I said, yeah, I'm also going to push for that. I was also, I think, this is, imagine, this is my job as foreign secretary. I opposed elements in my government who wanted a deployment ban of, of nurses. And I said, why? And the official, uh, well, even, you know, from the bureaucracy said, oh, just in case we get sick, we'd like to have them around. Really? I said, you want to have them around? Are you prepared to pay them while they stand around for you to get sick? No, then you should let them go because only now in Europe and all over the world, they are valued for what they are, the best caregivers ever. So little by little, I'm winning that fight and they're going to London, Germany and um, going to places where they are wanted and for God's sakes, they are at least decently paid for the risks they take and the work they do. But that's been my job. And, and traveling around, basically, the China was easy, although I can tell you, very, very strict. When I met with my good friend Wang Yi once, and I, we were working on the uh, code of conduct. Uh, we, we're a China coordinator. I wanted to push it faster. And I said to him, uh, I know that it's going very slow, even before the pandemic, but I'm telling you now, I'm offering our airline to bring everyone to Manila and, uh, and finish this discussion. And he laughed. 
Yes. Why are you laughing? It says because your uh, flight engineer is positive for COVID. And, what was it? and they put a PPE on me and they even said, hey, that PPE is not for your protection. It's for our protection from you. And it's been like that. They're very, very strict. China has licked the, the pandemic, but boy, the cost is, um, is tremendous. According to Adam Tooze in his book, Shutdown, they just close their eyes to the cost and that's what they're doing. I don't know how many countries can do that. Okay, um, we're doing it. We did um, the longest, strictest lockdown. It's had a really terrible effect on employment. No, I'm taking up all your time, please. Okay. And I was just going to say, in terms of the sort of high level diplomacy, how has the kind of lack of face to face contact affected your ability to get things done when it comes to sensitive issues like the, the code of conduct on the South China Sea, talking about what's happening in Myanmar? Um, how difficult is it to do those discussions on, on Zoom, on the phone, as opposed to face to face? Well, um, I was surprised. I'm not, I'm not a, what do you call it, techie? I'm just no good at that. Um, a, a computer, someone always helps me with that. But for a while, I thought it would be a hindrance, but it's not. It's actually saved us a lot of jet lag. Um, uh, ministers won't admit to that, but they're half dazed half, half the time. Um, and we end up talking to each other on Zoom. The other thing is we don't, um, how do you say, we don't grasp for ideas. When we go in front of the Zoom, we already know what you want to say. And from there, you can get an exchange, but none of this dithering around the issues. So that was good. But after a while, you also need, especially on the Myanmar issue, for example, why we met in Jakarta, because then it becomes a personal thing. It's among the leaders, one, and, um, and, their, and their alter egos, which is the foreign ministers. But we could really talk Turkey among ourselves. So the, uh, the general was there and we, could tell him our experiences. I'm not allowed to reveal that and say, look, um, our position is I want the restoration of the status quo and the coup because that was working very well for everyone, for every power in the region. China liked it that way. But then suddenly this thing happens. I understand it was an internal dynamic. Uh, the general wanted an extension of his term so he would have the same length as his predecessor, but because the election results came in, um, one interpretation is that the democratic forces felt overconfident and said, no, no extension. And then he said, okay, then everybody to jail. And, uh, but then since then, it is all of us, no one's imposing on anyone. If we don't solve this in, a, in the right way, if we, if we try to achieve a vacuous, Consensus, which is how we achieve consensus. It's a non-issue, and then we all agree. Fine, but this is a matter of the life and death of the credibility of ASEAN. Are we more than just people who agree over anodyne things? And that's why we're in this situation now. I think we'll come back a bit to Myanmar and ASEAN later. I just wanted to stick with COVID uh, for a bit now and, and vaccines, because I know that your president at the UN was saying that it was shocking beyond belief that we see rich countries, including Australia, now talking about booster shots uh, when many developing nations still haven't been able to do the first round of vaccinations. I think in the Philippines, you're now 30 percent of your target fully vaccinated and 65 percent uh, with one dose. Um, how difficult has it been for the Philippines to secure the vaccines you need? And what have you been able to do to address this problem? Um, uh, my president is reacting um, actually to what is it, the, the common uh, the scuttlebutt all over the world among leaders, that the rich countries, when you look at it from a certain perspective, are the ones who are hogging it. And, um, uh, and, and the poor countries don't have it. But in fact, we are getting it, and we're getting it through the COVAX facility, for which I, I um, praised uh, the United States, for example, in sending their, their Pfizer vaccines to us through COVAX. In other words, it's not, uh, it's not called uh, vaccine diplomacy. I remember when we started, the first vaccines we got were naturally the first ones invented, which was Sinovac and Sinopharm. When, when we started getting that, they were donations. And, um, and I said to, to my counterparts in China, I said, well, we'd like to buy it. And they said, we have 1.3 billion people here. We enter into contracts to sell. We lose control of when we want to give to you and when we need to administer it to our population. So no, 
we're speaking to donations. Again, as you can see, that's not vaccine diplomacy. So that's went very well. I talked to the British and they had AstraZeneca. That was great. They've divided the world between uh, the greatest pharmaceutical power in the, in the world, India, to take everything from India to Africa, Thailand, everything below them uh, going the other direction, covering us. And then something happened in India. And all those arrangements just evaporated. So we're doing what we can. And uh, I remember uh, I, the, the Americans, when we first, the new administration came in, and uh, they were a little apologetic about having ordered so much. I said, hey, I'm glad you over-ordered. Because if you did not, how would you be able to give us? We were not sure of our capacity to buy or order. So we hesitated. Oh, I've got, I'll accept that our mistake. We hesitated. And now you guys have more than you need. Now you're sending it to us. Can you imagine if you hadn't over-ordered? The other thing I realized, and talking to epidemiologists, apparently making these vaccines are not as easy and fast as we like to think. So the um, different different factories have different qualities. And so it's a big, big, uh, it's a big challenge. Um, so those who overordered, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, uh, blame them for anything. It's, I'm glad they did, and now they're sharing it. So that, that's the good part. Yeah, there is um, vaccine hesitation. That's the thing. That's a big problem. And in terms of the vaccines, obviously China, as you mentioned, has been probably the biggest single supplier to the Philippines. Um, outsiders tend to see this in terms of a battle for geopolitical influence. But do you think it's true that vaccine provision does give the supplier countries leverage in a, in a place like the Philippines? We, we have never experienced that, I can tell you. Uh, it, either you have it. I, um, we're very close relations with Russia. Um, and it has been that way. Well, since after the the, 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 the revolution um, that restored democracy, um, the the thing is that what, what I know is um, the, the, it's availability that counts. Uh, and of course, I got to tell you this: our Food and Drug Administration um, they're very strict. And so when I was I had a tendency to lose my temper and say, "Come on, let's go to the Russians immediately." And, and they'd say, no, there's no such thing as go to the Russians immediately. This, the, the way you do it is you go to specific factories and check. Oh, Jesus, I would blow my top all the time, but I guess they know what they're doing. And, 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 and that's what happened. And of course, just when we were about to clinch the Russian deal for Gamalea, uh, only Lancet peer-reviewed vaccine, the Germans turn to the Russians and uh, Merkel says, give us your, your, your Sputnik. Well, between the Philippines and the other side of the world, and Germany next door, I guess Germany won. So, but uh, but the production is ramping out, ramping up around the world. But you but you don't think it buys leverage for for Russia or for the U.S. or China? You know, having more vaccines, it's not something where you feel you know you're beholden to those countries on on other issues because of the support or the supply they've they've given you. No, no, it, it, there's not even been a suggestion of that. I think um, there's a real fear by by the great powers that if this continues, basically the world economy will implode, and then. Um, it's pretty much like climate change. It's where um, John Kerry and I completely agree. We got to get China in because if this world goes to hell uh, on the climate front, uh, we won't even have a battlefield to fight over. So I think those two things, climate change now and, and the, the pandemic has uh, just, it's an it's a alliance for convenience and survival. Later, I'm sure the fights will continue. The issues will, will, uh, will arise and the quarrels will intensify, but not on this trip. Well, I, I want to ask you a bit more about US-China competition because it is the defining struggle of our era and our region. Um, the Biden administration seems to have brought into the Trump administration's talk of full spectrum competition with China, but obviously executing with a bit more focus. Meanwhile, Xi Jinping and the Chinese government is really responding in kind. I think a couple of years ago, you yourself said that the Philippines can't do without American protection or Chinese progress. But how much more difficult do you think it is these days to enjoy both those things at the same time? Well, um, uh, 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 
Well, what, what I, think, I think the best thing that ever uh, encapsulated was something I wasn't aware of was Lee Kuan Yew had said a long time ago. Oh, I had a suspicion when I was in the UN. Um, the Asian Society asked me to speak. And I said, anecdotally, I said, you know, I, I've been in the States a long time. I, I've gone to, 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 to all that, to the, back, to the houses of the old aristocracy. And, like, and then how they love Chinese antiques and all of that which comes from their history of sending their, their spinster aunts as missionaries to China. There's really a special affection there, which explains Pearl Buck's um, bestseller status in, in the 50s and 60s. And then I said, my fear is not that the two will fight. My fear, I told the Asian society, is that the two will be really, really chummy. And then that was when a Singaporean told me, there's a better way of saying it. Lee Kuan Yew said, when elephants fight, there goes the grass. But when elephants make love, that's the end of the forest. And that's what you, and that's what we might be facing. Um, it's not impossible that American wealth increased enormously with the trade and investments in China. China's creation, recreation of itself as a new China, they really owe to American investments. It was a fantastic synergy. And then this came up. And there was, of course, a South China Sea issue, which was just us. When we fought for that arbitral award, we were alone. Nobody helped us. No one in Southeast Asia was on our side. No one in the West was on our side. But um, so when, when, when this thing came up, we weren't very sure whether the U.S. would be with us. And in fact, in the first incident, the one where we lost the reef, the U.S. was very ambiguous. It said, um, everybody, st both sides stand down. And, and so we did, uh, our boat did, the Chinese boat did, and it said, uh, now both sides withdraw. We, our boat did, China did not. And, um, and that was it. So well, what happened? And they said, we don't know what happened. Um, the best interpretation is to say, maybe they trusted China too much, or they really didn't care. I had a sense of this many, many years ago as the editor of my paper. When a SIGPAC commander, I mean, this was way before the, America and, and, and China were still great business partners. And, uh, and he, he was retiring, and he just came up with this announcement. Then he said, the United States is absolutely indifferent to any territorial fights in the South China Sea. Jesus, nobody asked him. And um, why would you encourage that? But I, I must give this to Hillary Clinton, who was in the State Department at the time, and when... I'm told this, and I can't be sure it's true, but I was told that a um, Chinese uh, diplomat asked her about that. And so what would happen if, you know, there was an increased presence in the South China Sea? And she had a very clever answer. She said, you're talking to the wrong person. You should talk to an admiral because that's his remit. You take the message for what it is. You enter there and you're talking to a guy with gun turrets. That's it. Uh, there's a way of putting your foot down without being, you know, offensive. And she had, she had the quality. She was very good. So despite the kind of the U.S. talk of, you know, full spectrum competition with China, do you doubt the U.S. resolve uh, to kind of stay the course in this, this competition? You think it's more likely in a way they'll find a, a way to have a rapprochement uh, with China? Well, I hope there's a rapprochement because we need to get, uh, I, I cannot imagine a world economic recovery without the engine of the Chinese economy. And the enormous, apparently, if you read Adam Tooze, the enormous capacity of America to keep generating wealth. That's the way to go. But um, if there was that hesitation, and there was, it was very common in the Philippines, this was fixed, may not be the most popular now, by Trump. Trump's diplomacy did it. Mike Pompeo's diplomacy did it. It just turned the whole situation around. Great. Uh, it's worked out very well. And then now they've gotten from a very vague language of the mutual defense treaty to very specifics. Any strike against a Philippine public vessel triggers the mutual defense treaty and so on. And I must tell you also, to be fair, uh, in talking about these things with the Chinese side, they also don't like changes in the, in the layout of power. Uh, they're used to the way it is like the Soviets. And I, Check this also with the Americans. In the Soviet Union, you would talk to your other, to the other side and say, if we do this, what will you do? And they would say, we'll do this. So you, know, you anticipate each other's moves on no mistakes. Apparently, the Americans and the Chinese military commanders do that. 
So that's good. And, um, and, and, and that's clarified the situation a lot. They are not happy, the Chinese are not happy by sudden changes in the layout of world power. Um, even, some, even some changes that, are, that seem favorable to them, they say, what you have done actually is uh, introduced uncertainty in the equation. We all know when and how we're gonna fight. Now you have introduced some a variable say the VFA, when it was uh, abrogated, and then I suspended the abrogation, and finally the president restored it. Um, and you know that this isn't really the mutual defense treaty. That's just how you take jurisdiction of an erring serviceman. But still, it sent the wrong signal, and it heightened tensions all over Southeast Asia. The Chinese were not crazy about that. You mentioned the visiting forces agreement there, the VFA, which was kind of which was going to be terminated and then not. And that, I think that marked a period of kind of tension or instability in the U.S. Philippines relationship. But you've just been to D.C. You've met Secretary Blinken for the first time. This is the 70th anniversary of the mutual defense treaty and 75 years of U.S. Philippine uh, relationship since the kind of colonial relationship ended. Do you think there is now a new stability? Uh, in ties between the U.S. and the Philippines, a new understanding, if you like, between both countries? Um, well, if, if I may um, uh, just say that what it did was not increase tensions between the Philippines and, and, and the U.S. Um, what it did was increase tensions between China and the U.S. As uh, some observers on both sides would say, okay, now the United States doesn't have the Philippines at its back. I mean, you know, uh, the, the Philippines doesn't have the U.S. back. That doesn't mean the United States is pulling out. That means they're coming in and in big, in big force. And their uh, freedom of navigation operations, their flybys were getting more and more medicine. So if there was any tension here. That sudden uncertainty we introduced increased it between the two great powers. And now it's back to the way it was and everybody knows what they're gonna do from the worst scenario to the best scenario, no more uncertainties. No surrender, no withdrawal, but no uncertainties. I mean, there's been some nervousness in Southeast Asia about how committed the Biden administration really is to engaging with the region, to engaging with ASEAN. I mean, what were the vibes of your meeting with Secretary Blink? I mean, do you think that the US will be kind of following through uh, with what it's been saying about you know, deepening its, its relationships in Southeast Asia and turning up more often for the key key events and forums? No, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I don't have that, that, that sense. That's an old feeling that we've had with the mutual defense treaty since way before. When we, when, when we took power in 86, we overthrew Marcos and we were there, and there was always this uncertainty. Um, will they really back us up? And in the crudest terms, some, some nationalists, Filipino nationalists would say, do you actually think the United States um, would come to the, would respect the mutual defense treaty with um, a colored people, Filipinos? So I brought this up. Uh, that was my job under, under Coy Aquino and others. And they said, what are you talking about? We don't care about your color. We, we signed a mutual defense treaty with you to contain the Soviet Union. You're on this part of the world and, um, uh, and Berlin is the other one that we signed with. Supposing you're attacked and we do not, as you say, respond. What do you think Berlin will do? They'll drop us. If they cannot defend the Filipinos just because of something like their color, well, how do we know they won't uh, drop us also in a confrontation with the Soviet Union just because of our history of enmity in World War II. So they said, please, it is a part, and that's when they told me, why don't you study your Morgenthau a, little, a bit more and, and realize that great powers need prestige. That's a great part of their power, actually, influence. They must never be seen to break their word, whatever the, the cost will be. And so I was pretty happy with that. Nothing sentimental about their response, just saying, it's how the calculus of power proceeds. So I, I believe that too. They will lose credibility everywhere. Uh, I know what's, strike, what's in your mind now. You're probably thinking, what about Kabul? Uh, well, that's a more complicated situation. Well, I, I was actually going to ask... I was going to ask you about Australia, actually, uh, which is another, another US ally, uh, cel also celebrating 75 years of diplomatic relations with the Philippines this year. But from a from Manila perspective, where does Australia sit? Where does it fit into the, the Philippine strategic outlook for the region? 
uh, from the very start, well, when, when I got into, into foreign affairs, both as ambassador and as secretary, I always felt that uh, with regard to ASEAN, I want, that's my position anyway, it's open. I want Australia to be part of ASEAN. They may not find it convenient, but I say geogra uh, ASEAN, I said, is not an ethnic, cultural, or in any way Asian grouping. It is a geographical group grouping for mutual defense and uh, regional stability. What rounds out the circle of security is the anchor of Australia right underneath. I said this at the Asian Society and I said, there it is. It's just hanging there. And Kevin Rudd started to laugh. <laughs> You're almost making it seem as if they're just, you know, pair of iron balls, <laughs> he goes. I said, but he, he enjoyed his own joke. But it's true. I really believe that, that that is what it is. It's a geographic grouping for mutual security. And they, and they really fit. Um, I, I must tell you also, when, when it came to, we were trying to get submarines, we we're gonna buy it from France, which comes with a 20 year uh, warranty and training, but we were, um, advice. Uh, one is once you get it from Brazil, where they actually make it, and of course the French said, well, when you do that, you don't get the 20-year warranty. And then someone suggested in the American department, so why don't you get two extra from, from uh, Australia, because they seem to have ordered two more than they wanted, than they needed. And um, next thing you know, it's changed with AUKUS, and now it's going to be nuclear subs. And you know my position on that. That strengthens uh, the parents, because when one one power is too far away, the other power may think that proximity gives them an advantage. But when the whole area of a future battlefield is just swarming with really deadly weaponry, that clears the mind, focuses uh, thinking, and um, makes them realize that never overreach, because they. Um, the response will be immediate and possibly devastating. It could also be this. If you did not have AUKUS and the, and the nuclear submarines uh, swarming the area, both of both, of both powers, all powers, uh, if you didn't have that, there would be that lag because what Mearsheimer says, there's the stopping power of water. There would be a delay in, say, an American response to a Chinese overreach. The problem with delay is that the other side will say, oh God, they've already established a, <clears throat> um, a fait accompli, status quo, so the hit will be stronger. Now just imagine if there was just an accident that happens in the South China Sea, swarming with different vessels. I think they'd be able to solve it commander to commander. And, and, and you know, that's to me, that's just my reason why I stuck my neck out for AUKUS when the rest of ASEAN held back. Why do you think your neighbors like Indonesia and Malaysia are, are much more concerned than, than the Philippines? Do you think that they're actually privately more supportive and they're scared of, of Beijing's reaction? Or you think those are kind of deep, genuinely held fears on their part? I think um, there, there is a reaction to, to, to increasing the swarming in the South China Sea by, by rival powers. One is you, you could also be inviting a conflict. But I come from I'm an old man, I come from the Cold War, and that's how, what I saw, the success of the parents. So I'm just coming from that direction. My colleagues in ASEAN are much younger than I am, um, so they see things another way. But we'll be talking to each other uh, quite a lot about that. And Australia, in some ways, finds itself in a similar position to the Philippines, with the US as a security guarantor and China as key economic partner. And also, um, unpleasantly for Australia, has found itself on the end of Chinese economic coercion, as the Philippines has in, in the past. Do you think Australia can learn anything from you know, the Philippines' experience of trying to kind of live uh, between China and, and the US and balance these, these forces out? No, it's the same with the Philippines. Uh, I can tell you that um, in all the time I have dealt with Beijing, and the, the foreign minister, they have never uh, taken exception to our friendship and al military alliance with the United States. Um, it's not, for them, it's not incompatible. Economic cooperation, business advantages, and um, security concerns, that's fine. Um, they just want predictability. They just want to know where everyone's cards are and how under their, say, where I come from, under theory of deterrence, 
how you're going to move your pieces. So I'm changing metaphors here. How are you going to move your pieces? In what circumstances? So, sorry to interrupt, but why do you think Beijing seems to have more of a problem with Australia's alliance with the US? Because it seems that there's a perception that that is something that they're uncomfortable with, uh, whereas you say that they're OK with the Philippines alliance. So why do you think there's this differential treatment for Australia compared to, to some others? I got to admit, I'm, I'm rather puzzled because uh, there's a great economic opportunity on both sides. Um, minerals, uh, uh, domestic products, Australian wine, possibly the best, unless you talk to a Frenchman. Um, but um, I don't understand that because we are actually, our engagement with the United States is actually more deeply military than, than Australia. One is its, its geography. As I said, it rounds out the, the, the Southeast Asian region, but that also means it's in, in the extremity. They're not in the battlefield, in the future battlefield. So that is a puzzle to me and for, for me, it's a wasted opportunity um, for Australia. Um, the, you can continue to be uh, geopolitical rivals, um, military uh, hostile, if you want to be. But I, I really don't understand why that's happening at all. Um, at the same time, then you get news that um, American business with China is, is pretty robust. Uh, from big American companies, still going on, including with Apple. So um, I don't know how they got dragged into that one. Uh, perhaps you could help us understand. <laughs> Well, I think yeah, we're still trying to to understand it here, but it seems that there's a there's a perception that Australia is a weak link in in the U.S. alliance system, and I, I suspect that's partly what what the issue is. Um, but I, I want to ask you a bit more about the South China Sea, which which you mentioned. We know that the tensions there kind of ebb and flow with this with the seasons and with the typhoons, but in the medium term, it does seem that the pressure on claimant states, including the Philippines, is rising, along with the risks of conflict. I mean, how dangerous would you say the situation is at the moment? Um, I don't think it's dangerous. They understand every move they make that um, violates what we, what we know are our rights. Remember, they have claims, we have rights because we went to court and we won. Uh, so I, I don't see any potential for a sudden flare up. But what happens is they, they, they try and then I, I file diplomatic protests, which apparently you know, negates any, any suggestion that their occupation of that area for a short period of time can change into, into ownership. So that's it. We keep doing it and, and uh, we're doing very well. And do, do you think, obviously, ASEAN member states are negotiating a code of conduct with China on the South China Sea. It's been in talks for many, many years. They drag on and on and on. Do you think that in the end it will actually be, when it's finished, a useful tool uh, for the balance of power, or is it more actually a, an implicit recognition of, of China's hegemony over, over the South China Sea? That's very good, sir. Um, because I maybe quite understand, because I, I was noticing it, and there was resistance from the Western powers. And I said, they just want to, the China, the COC is just meant to, to, to see how we can continue to use freedom, freedom of navigation. And in the event of a collision or anything like that, we have a mechanism for settling it. And then it struck me why the West didn't want it. The fact that you need a code of conduct in this area is already a recognition that the dominant power is China. That must have been it. Uh, that's my guess. But, but I think that's really where it's coming from. Um, the fact that he said, but I'll tell you, it's going so slow. Um, we're comfortable with it. Uh, we know we have, uh, we have the mutual defense treaty. We have our arrange military arrangements with Australia. We're covered. But maybe if you are on the Asian mainland and the army is just 72 hours away, consisting of, say, one million men, maybe you wouldn't be as, you know, as sanguine as I am out here in the archipelago. Uh, again, Mearsheimer's stopping power of water. Uh, we're protected, Indonesia's protected, that's why Indonesia is more flexible. Um, but those on the mainland are not so happy. 
And I want to talk more about China's style of diplomacy. I mean, you mentioned yourself, Secretary, that you know, you, you're not averse to issuing strongly worded uh, you know, diplomatic protests. But recently, we've seen China take a turn to a much more aggressive style of you know, what people have called wolf warrior diplomacy. It seems to have backfired in the West. Public opinion has turned against China. But I wonder what your take on it is from, from a Philippines perspective. Do you think it's actually an effective approach for China to communicate its views and to get others to back down? Or do you think it, it risks turning countries against it? Um, no, I, I don't think it really matters. One is if I tried to make a fuss about that, they would tell me, hey, look, coming from the mother wolf, you're going to ask us to behave. So, you know, uh, forget it. And um, it's the same. I, I think... Uh, as a, as a newsman, okay, let me speak like a newsman. Wolf, wolf, diploma, what do they call it? Wolf diplomacy? Wolf warrior. Wolf warrior. Wolf warrior. Oh, yeah, that's a movie, right? A, a, a Chinese movie about a, an African rescue mission. Anyway, the wolf warrior thing forces them to articulate very clearly their extreme position, which sometimes comes to, is refreshing because the Americans are also known for wolf warriors. In fact, that's their style of doing it, uh, laying down the law. So the, uh, sometimes it's good because you know what's the extreme. Uh, if you, the language of traditional Asian diplomacy or European diplomacy is so, so soft, so, gener so filled with generalities, you really don't know where you are. Now, at least you know what's the red line for them and what's the red line. And they know from us what's the red line from us. I don't think wolf warrior diplomacy has been bad. And um, if I, I, I think I should uh, share this with you. Okay, you had an example of wolf warrior diplomacy by both worlds in Anchorage, Alaska. Was that Anchorage? Yes, Anchorage. And I thought, oh, it must have been terrible, but I have it from within that after the cameras, the, the newsmen left, they had a really fruitful discussion. Everyone had gotten all this animosity off his chest and then they sat down to business. And it was a long, long meeting after that. So, okay, that's good. It's the same, uh, I did that to the Chinese when I first came in. Uh, I was interviewed by the Global Times, which is the military newspaper. And, and they were talking and I said, you know what? Uh, I told the publisher, uh, I said, the, ro the road of Philippine Chinese cooperation and mutual benefit is actually a highway. It's wide and full of opportunities. But there is a pebble in the middle of that highway. And you know what? With all that space, that's where we're going to stumble. And that's where we're going to fight. I was happy. I thought he wouldn't print that interview, but it came out in the Global Times. So I guess what? it's clarifying. Well, as you say, you've been a communicator all your life, but you're also a bit, you've, I think you've described yourself as the original wolf warrior, right? Before you're an active tweeter. You've got 700,000... Sorry, you've got 700,000 followers. You tend to speak your mind, I think it's fair to say. But yeah, I was going to ask, what role does social media play in your diplomacy? And are there risks to this kind of approach? I, I got to be honest with you about that. When I do Twitter, one is, I'm sorry when I, when I resort to bad words, scurrilous words, um, but that's my temper. And I, I, my daughter's always around to delete it. I can tell you that there are more of what you see there. That's just it. Uh, my daughter, and you know daughters, right? They just bully us. Um, and they just take it out. They just takes it out. But what, I, what it does is it clarifies issues in my mind. And then I get a chance to reformulate them in an elegant way, if I can. Yeah. So, but that I am appealing to the public. Actually, everyone on my following on Twitter, uh, I'm not a popular guy. It's just that they... We like to engage each other. Half of those guys on Twitter that follow me, they want to brain me. And then, but uh, I keep the conversation going. I never, I never stop. Uh, and not, nor do they. They listen to me. They argue with me. And it's a great way of exchange. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not a weapon. It's just a way of clearing the air. Okay. I want to come back to ASEAN and Myanmar, which you mentioned at the start. Um, we've got the key annual ASEAN summits coming up later this month. And I know your Malaysian counterpart has suggested that Min Aung Hlaing, uh, the chief of the military junta in Myanmar, should not be allowed to attend the ASEAN summits because the military government has failed to cooperate with ASEAN's envoy. I mean, do you agree with that view that, that the head of the military should not be allowed 
to attend the ASEAN summit? Yes. Um, it should be, uh, you mean the head, the junta head? Yeah, the head of the junta, Min Ong Lai. No. Uh, that's my position. I will be sitting down with my, with my ASEAN colleagues about it, but um, I'm pretty definitive about this. First, I want to see really the return of the status quo. Um, and when I asked for that, um, uh, from the very start, that was my position. I even uh, insulted the Europeans for, for denigrating uh, Suu Kyi over the Rohingya issue and weakening her, uh, her, her hand in, in, the, in the Myanmar political equation. I said, but from the start, we all got, a well, got along very well, all the powers, with that semi-democratic government. Why did you have to do that? And we can't move forward unless you go back to the way it was. And when I made that statement, I also said the army of Myanmar is essential to its existence because without that army, and if we listen to the Europeans, and the usual crowd there uh, that went after Suu Kyi, Myanmar would become what they made Libya, a hellhole of anarchy. That's what's gonna happen there. So the army must stay there. What's their problem? Once another six years, you can have it. So none of my business. But to destroy that, uh, and to destroy basically I have a sentimental look, uh, view of Suu Kyi, not only was she my writer in my newspaper, she writes very, very well, I can tell you that, but um, she is historically the daughter of George Washington, of the Burmese, you know, her father founded that nation. Her father founded that army, just like Washington founded the Continental Army. You're going to take her out of the equation? Where's your, where's your personality? Where's your identity? So uh, I don't think I can, I can compromise on that. I follow Malaysia. And what, what more do you think ASEAN can do on Myanmar, given those core principles of non-interference and respect for, for national sovereignty? Realistically, how much further can ASEAN push? Well, um, we can continue with this, keeping, keeping them at a distance. Um, but as I said, you know, if we, if we do, if we relent in any way, our credibility as a real regional organization disappears. Uh, what's that? We're, we're, we're a bunch of guys who always agree with each other on the worthless things, the things that don't count in the world. Well, I don't know what that is, but it doesn't seem like a vibrant alliance or a regional grouping. So, and, and I'll tell you, all my colleagues uh, in, 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 in ASEAN and, and the leaders themselves, um, they, they know that, they share that view. And even if sometimes you say some of those on the mainland may be softer, that's just, they're trying to keep an opening. Don't make them feel that their backs are against the, the wall, um, but they all know what's at stake, the credibility of this uh, association. So. Do you think ASEAN can push harder, like maybe even suspending Myanmar's membership? Do you think it needs that kind of tougher approach, a next level of almost sanctions, or is that too, a step too far? Uh, I, I, well, uh, what sanctions can we impose? But I can tell you one thing, I do believe, and my ambassador in Washington, um, we must continue to help the people of Myanmar. And so on vaccines, um, while my ambassador there, of course, would have been happy if he could have argued for the Philippines to receive more vaccines from the United States, his argument was, don't forget Myanmar. And my argument over here was, and don't forget the small island states. And a pandemic outbreak in small island states in the, in the South Pacific literally erases them. Um, so no, no. Uh, but this I added when we were asked to make that commitment. I said, however, if the junta insists that the vaccination be carried out by the army, perhaps it's the only thriving organization there that can, that can uh, roll out vaccines. I don't want it to be, you get a job and you go to jail because now we have you in our hands. Or you get inoculated and then you get incarcerated because you have just shown your face. So that's out of the question. Cannot be a weapon for civil control. I, I want to ask a bit more about domestic policy because obviously it often drives foreign policy. And as foreign secretary, you've had to deal with some very strong criticism of the Duterte administration's human rights record. The International Criminal Court has recently launched an investigation into the mass killings uh, during the war on drugs. I think your government has said that it won't cooperate with that investigation. Why is that, given everything the Philippines has said about the importance of international law in other issues like the, the South China Sea? 
Well, um, on that issue, by the way, I was the one who pulled us out of the ICC. Um, the minute I, I, I pulled us out when I was, a, when I was a, a ambassador to the United Nations. That's because, again, as I said, I'm an old man from the Cold War. And we were warned by the United States when the ICC came out. You do not subscribe to that because we have a military alliance. Our soldiers will be in your part of the world. Your, your soldiers will be training in ours. We cannot have an outs because the U.S. is leery of international organizations, you know, getting jurisdiction over them. If something should happen with one of our soldiers in your area, things can happen when people are armed. Um, you know, of course, that you will have to surrender them to the, to the ICC. And so you should not. And so from, Korea, from every administration, it went on. The Senate was never given a chance to, to uh, ratify, I mean, to, 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 to accept the, the ICC treaty, except for one, and this is a very personal thing. Uh, we had a great senator. She, should have, she, could have, she might well have won the second presidential election uh, after Cory Aquino. Um, instead, Ramos won. She's feisty, she's smart. Um, and we felt, and, and, and she, I asked her, why don't you run for the Senate? So you can, you know, cool your heels or make another run for the president. And she did, and she won. And then, um, but I know her heart, we, everyone knew her heart was in, in, in international law. And, uh, and the senators really admired and loved her. And so when she was stricken with cancer, um, in an excess of emotion, they ratified the ICC and then nominated her to enter. In fact, she never made it. She died before she could do that. So that's what it is. As far as I'm concerned, I come from that part. Of, you, you, you got when the president took me as foreign secretary, or for that matter, as UN representative. He knew my background. Um, he, uh, to begin with, um, uh, his best friend then, uh, uh, Chito Ayala, uh, the, uh, one of the banana kings. They grow bananas in Mindanao in plantations. Um, was his was his um, his, his, his patron. So he knew um, my personality. He knew where I was coming from, the, the role I played in, in, in maintaining U.S.-Philippine relations, and Corey and everyone and everyone that followed. So um, when, 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 I, when I took that position, they accepted it. This is, the, this is what, we, what we hired. This is what we get. Now, whether on this case now, uh, it has to do not with, but with cases previous to the withdrawal by withdrawal from the ICC, well, it's being studied now by the Department of Justice, headed by the Secretary of Justice, Guevara, who's arguably well, the most sober, smart jurist I've ever met. So he'll make the decision how to, how to engage this without in any way uh, implying or suggesting that we are re ever returning to the ICC. Not why we have military alliances to consider. I also want to ask about Maria Ressa, the Philippine journalist who founded Rapless. She won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, recently for her work for, and I'm quoting here, exposing abuse of power, the use of violence, and the growing authoritarianism in her native country. I think it's the Philippines' first ever Nobel Prize, if I'm not mistaken. How do you feel about uh, Maria winning that award? Well, I, I congratulated her uh, when, when she won it. I said, wow, you're really lucky. You have better friends than my president, um, Corazon Coanco Aquino. All Mrs. Aquino did was restore democracy. All she did was prove to the world that peaceful people power taught by Gandhi, never practiced by Gandhi, can work to change the political uh, situation. She restored democracy without a shot fired. And you know what? The only one who was competing with her was a Costa Rican president. I can't even remember what the guy did that he should have been mentioned. But there was something I, I, I told uh, in my tweet. I said, Maria, you really have good friends. They knew how to, how to present your case to the Nobel Committee. I had the woman who changed the world. People power liberated Eastern Europe. It was the example they all followed and they took it. And she couldn't get. Nobel Prize, Peace Prize. So I said, boy, are you lucky with your friends. Now, as for the question of, of, uh, of uh, press suppression, tyranny, etc., again, I'm old. We have the biggest newspaper in the country. 
it wasn't virtual. It wasn't something in the cloud. It was a whole plant. It was the best printing plant outside Japan because we built it. Because we, it was founded in 1908. It fought the Americans in the American occupation. It attacked every president. Um, and then finally, under Marcos, his personal friend, nonetheless, it was shut down. I was there when the army came in and uh, I was on the phone. The colonel just slapped the phone out of my face. And uh, then they swept in. I immediately ran into the printing plant and shut it down before they shoot it, thinking maybe a month later we could open up again. But so when it comes to suppression of press freedom, I know it when I see it because I lived it. My father went to jail. So, oh, but there are different standards now. Um, I call that the age of bronze journalism. This is now the age of whatever, internet, I guess. I don't know what you lose when you are shut down in the internet. I want to move on before we run out of time to a few questions from our audience. Um, so the first one is from Zenny Edwards, who's from the Australian Council for Human Rights Education. And she asks what the Philippines is doing to mitigate the problems caused by climate change. Well, I'll th um, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, off the cuff, I can tell you the Philippines um, had this fascination with, with the threat of uh, climate change, I think well before anyone else. We passed uh, the strongest anti-pollution laws, some of which uh, come from a family that's also in, 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 med in, in, in the hospitals and um, uh, created danger. Our laws forbid the incineration of hospital waste. Even the Europeans are telling us, what are you doing? So there's, there are ways to, get, to, to burn that without endangering the planet. I said, we'll think about it. But so far, the, the law is iron, no pollution to the extent we can. We are, however, as Guterres in UN likes to introduce me, and here is the representative of the third biggest plastics polluter on the planet. <laughs> and what can I say? So we're trying to stop that too. Um, and uh, more of the youth are, are involved. Yes, we're doing what we can, uh, everything we can, because as, as um, President Duterte and anyone who knows anything, I didn't believe it at first, but the frequency and ferocity of typhoons uh, hitting our part of the world, especially the Philippines, leads me to suspect that climate change is real and it's an imminent threat. So no, we're, 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 we're very aware of it. Uh, all the ones, it, and you might find out somebody said, oh, that's Ted. He's the one at the Security Council, which uh, where they were tackling the issue of climate change and rising ocean levels. Then I said, well, this is terrible. But however, I must tell you, um, I see one bright spot in climate change and rising ocean levels. And that is that one day, all those disputed features taken from us will all be underwater. <laughs> the Chinese laugh, the Americans laugh. <laughs> you know, but uh, that I was being flippant. But the truth is, yeah, it means a lot. And that's why I believe this COP26, I hope China and, and, and John Kerry and the others get together in this. There's so many other things you can quarrel and fight about, but not this. And, and apparently the Chinese are taking it seriously. So I'll be following that. I'll be going there as well. Um, talking about quarrelling, we had quite a few questions about Taiwan, where we've seen tensions rising in the last few months. If the US were to be drawn into a conflict with China over Taiwan, what would the Philippines do, given the mutual defence treaty you have with the United States? Uh, the mutual defence treaty is, um, protects uh, what they call metropolitan territory. An attack on the Philippine territories or now expanded to public vessels in, 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 in Philippine seas will be an attack on the metropolitan territory and so we go to war. Um, Taiwan is not part of our territory. So, and I don't know if they have a mutual defense treaty with the United States, but it was the United States that actually, um, because of Nixon, made us recognize Red China. We never had a quarrel with Red China, but it was, you know, communists were Catholic, uh, you know, it is in the, the 50s, 60s. But um, it was the United States that took the initiative and said one China policy. And we adopted it. And that's it. So now there's only one China. To the extent possible, we make no reference to, to Taiwan. We respect that. 
Um, I know the Americans themselves, and I, I think the Americans, when they did that, made a special arrangement for Taiwan, but I don't know what it is, and I don't want to know. That's important. Um, another question from John Jethro Manangan, who's from the Philippines Army. Um, he asks what impact AUKUS will have on Philippine-Australia relations. You've said you've su you support it, but do you think it will, can change the dynamics, I guess, of Philippines-Australia relations oh. going forward? Not at all. I, I think it complements the great relationship we have with the Australian uh, defense establishment. When the VFA came, uh, was, under, um, was under question uh, in, the, in the early part of the Duterte administration, I'll give this to my president. He's strong, impulsive and all of that, but he always stops after his impulsiveness and then he asks for advice. For him, if it's defense, the only ones he wants to hear, to hear are men in uniform. So he called what looked like a cabinet meeting, all the chairs filled with people in, in uniform, except for myself, I'm not a soldier. Uh, and then he asked them, what do you think of the VFA? And one grievance after another came out saying, I, I, I said, why is it that Australians treat us so well when we train there? Why is it that our wives can find work, our children go to school, but when it is Fort Bragg, it's not the same. It's like they don't like us. First, I thought that was, why would you bring that up? But you know, American officers told me, hey, that's, you're not a soldier. So you don't know how important it is for a soldier to feel when he is training with an ally that he is welcome, that his family is safe. He says, no, your, your officers are correct. We could do better. But then I've tried to explain that Australia is a big, big country and a very tolerant population. Um, America is a big, big country with a lot of people and very deeply divided on racial, political, and other grounds. So maybe we shouldn't hold them up to the great Australian standard. That really annoys people when I say that. But it is true. Our soldiers, our officers really love working with Australia on defense. So this will, this just, uh, of course, even if I didn't think about the parents theory, I would have listened to our soldiers and, and say, yeah, they treat you well. So we, we stand by Australia the way they okay. stand by you. I mean, also on that issue, Steve Kunstler asks, what tangible steps can the Philippines and Australia's take to protect free passage through the South China Sea? And I guess a follow up would be, for example, would you, would you encourage Australia to conduct freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea as the US has done? Well, the freedom of navigation uh, operations is, is there in the international law of the sea, but so they can do it. And, and, and as you know, they've come in uh, and they're trained. Our, so our Navy and Coast Guard are, are training with them. Uh, so that's obvious. Uh, uh, if, okay, when the COC first came up and I was in the UN, the first thing I threw out was a suggestion that the COC would somehow implicitly exclude Western powers. No way. I said, no, the COC is how to, will govern how uh, our vessels and Chinese vessels, if they ever get into a disagreement or a collision or whatever, how that will be solved. But there's nothing to do with uh, excluding any other power from the region. Okay, we're, we're almost out of time, Secretary Loxian, but I've got one last question for you. Obviously, you've had a lot of experience in your career as a, a journalist, a lawyer, a legislator, diplomat, foreign secretary, advisor to four presidents, uh, I believe, uh, or you've worked for four presidents. Um, what do you think the legacy of the Duterte administration will be as it enters its, its last year? How do you think people will see uh, President Rodrigo Duterte in kind of the, the history of the Philippines and what will be his contribution? Um, uh, it's worse. I, we can't even understand the past. It's hard to predict the future, but I can tell you this. From the words of an American senator who said the restoration of the VFA, the restoration of, of the, old, the old military alliance is better off now for what happened. The disagreements that Duterte had with the United States. Every president since independence has wanted to have an independent foreign policy. That's a fact. If Magsaysay does not seem like it, there's the old legend that um, CIA, somebody, Lansdale, had put him in power. That's not true. It was my dad's friends who put him in power. Um, but uh, I can tell you, every president, Quirino wanted it. Um, Garcia wanted it. Uh, 
Makapagal wa wanted it. Every president wanted the first to actually do it, to go on their own, was Marcos. Here's the guy who jailed my dad, but I give him credit for that. He went to Russia and he went to China. And then after that, Mrs. Aquino had that lingering sense that I don't want to be pushed around by Americans. That's why she was too late defending the bases. Uh, when it came time to renew the U.S. bases, um, she hesitated. But the Senate had already decided that they were going to go and abolish it. And then the volcano exploded, which made it moot and academic. Then she went out in the streets and tried to restore, I mean, to get the vote for the U.S. bases to live. Every president has wanted. And now this U.S. senator tells me, you know what you guys, what he did? Now we realize we should not take the Philippines for granted. And it would be a healthier relationship from here on. And all the things that our soldiers complain about, all of those things should be taken into consideration. So in the end, that to me, Duterte has finally given us. And in some respects, you know, it comes also from the, emo the emotional side that people don't like. Um, when the Balangiga bells came and they, were, uh, and they were put back in the old church from which they were taken by the U.S. cavalry, um, my friend, the uh, ambassador to the United States was with him. And he said, he asked everyone to get out except him. And he just ran his hands over the names of those who had been killed by American soldiers. And he started to cry. It's a thing they have. Uh, uh, if you want to give a little more history, you know where that strain of resentment comes from? My own experience. My father loved the Americans because of the liberation of the Philippines, right? And then a book came out. You should, uh, it was called Little Brown Brother. The, the author was beautifully written, Leon Wolf. He wrote in Flanders Fields. Um, it was the first time we ever read that it was a massacre when the Americans came in during the Philippine American War. And for some reason, these old people, they never forget what they read. And that changed the narrative. One book, one man. And he was an American. And um, now that's all out. Duterte has brought out everything in the past that he has resented. Um, and yet we go forward with the United States. And as the American senator said, now it's a mature relationship. Okay, well, on that positive note, thank, thank you so much, Secretary Loxin, for sharing your time and your views with us today. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you to everyone who's been watching. And I do hope you'll all join us again soon for another Lowy Institute event. And in the meantime, please stay safe and stay well.